meeting and welcome to Wednesday Bible Reading Chapel. This morning we begin in the name of the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship with the singing of hymn 390. Because of the length of the hymn, I will recite stanza one and we will all sing stanzas two and three. The hymn is 390, a great Lutheran hymn. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is the one redeemer. Many theologians have said that if we lost the entire Bible, which God promises will never happen, but if we did, but we had the book of Romans, we would have more than enough to know the way to heaven. It's probably one of those greatest books of the Bible. I want to share again what Mr. Kerr shared the two weeks ago, what Luther said about this book. It's just a great quote. This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament. It's truly the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. We can never read it or ponder over it too much, for the more we deal with it, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Pastor Haig, by God's grace, gets to teach this book of the Bible every single year. And I'm sure Pastor Haig has large parts of this 16-chapter book committed to memory. You could probably read almost any verse of this book, and he could, you start the verse, he would finish it for you. In chapter 1, two weeks ago, Mr. Kerr took us through, The Gentiles are sinful. And they're in trouble with God. Last week, Mr. Thiesfeld took us through chapter 2. You Jews are no better than the Gentiles. You folks are sinful, and you are in trouble with God. In chapter 3, in the first eight verses, Paul, who probably would have been a great lawyer, anticipates some of the questions that Jews might start asking, almost in a type of sarcastic way. The Jews did have some advantages. They had the word of God. They had the promises. They had the prophecies. They had the prophets. But they were still sinful, and they were in trouble with God. So maybe the Jews are going to come up with, well, if God is going to forgive all our sins, then the more we sin, the greater God looks because he's forgiving even more sins. The more evil we do, the more gracious God will be. So as Lucas reads the first eight verses on your devices and in your Bibles, follow along with the question and answer, question and answer portion, verses 1 through 8.
Romans chapter 3. What advantage, then, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do good, let us do evil, that good may result. Their condemnation is just. In the next section, Paul is going to review some highlights from the Old Testament, proving that the Jews and the Gentiles both are condemned as sinners under God's law. You will notice a lot of this section, verses 9 through 20, are footnoted in your NIV if you have the study Bible. And much of what Lucas will read next comes from the Psalms, a little of it from Ecclesiastes, and some of it even from Isaiah. All of this will be concluded at verse 20 when Paul summarizes and says, therefore, in conclusion, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin. As it is written, There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. No one is righteous in God's sight, according to his law. That's true of students from WLA, whether they be from the United States, or Belgium, or Russia, or France, or Spain. All are sin. All are guilty. All need help. Thankfully, our chapter ends now with God's plan of salvation. Verses 21 to 31. Righteousness, not from works, only from God, by his grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 23, all of you have memorized. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Also, when we get to verse 28, just a little trivia, when Martin Luther translated his Bible into German from the Greek language, he added a word. Verse 28 says, We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Luther added the word alone, which is taught clearly in the book of Ephesians. We maintain a man is justified by faith alone. We hear the conclusion of chapter 3, the gospel of salvation through Christ. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. 
There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. This is the word of God. Now, if you would turn back to hymn 390, I will recite stanza four. You can follow along, and then we will all sing together stanzas five and six. The beautiful gospel, salvation is found by faith in Christ alone. Stanza 4 reads, Yet, as the law must be fulfilled or we must die despairing, Christ came and has God's anger stilled, our human nature sharing. He has for us the law obeyed and thus the Father's vengeance stayed, which over us impended. And we close with the blessing. May the blessing of the eternal God be upon us, his light to guide us, his presence to shelter us, and his peace to unite us. Amen.